Okay, we got three problems to do. Let's see what I can make happen here. Hopefully I can get it all right the first time. Number 35 in chapter 6 looks something like this. We have two blocks. Um, little mass M, big mass M. This surface here is rough. The surface here is smooth. And we know that little m is 16 kilograms, big M is 88 kilograms. The coefficient of static friction on the rough surface is 0.38. And there is some force F being applied here. And we want to know uh, what must F be. for the smaller block to not slip. So this is one of those kind of cool things where you can, you know, if you've ever pushed something against a wall to hold it in place, like you're pushing horizontally, yet somehow it's not falling vertically. So let's take a look at M, a little mass. Force is acting on it. We know that we have gravity acting down. We know that we have this force F pushing to the right. We know that we have, you know, friction pointing upwards. That's what's going to keep this thing in place ultimately. Sorry, I gave away the mystery. Um, and there is some force pushing backwards. This is where this, this is how this is a third law problem. So this is on little m by big M. If we look at big M, we get the same kind of thing going on where we have, you know, gravity. This time, acting up, we have the normal force. And then there's the third law pairing uh, on big M by little m. You'll notice something that's important. This force, the horizontal force acting on m, is not F. It is emphatically not F. Now there are a couple ways to think of this. A third thing that we could draw, we could also talk about m plus m. If we talk about m plus m, then there is, um, oh, this is where it gets weird. F is definitely acting here. And there is some weight, and then this is, I guess, probably the normal force there may have to be a friction force. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to not go this way because I have little time and this is to me it looks complicated. If we wanted to do this in a test like scenario that's not going to be a good option. So let's take a look here. One thing we know the two blocks are moving together. So there is only one acceleration which means that we have this statement, that F minus F on M by M must equal little m a, and F on M, oof, F om, I don't, I don't know what I'm going with there, by M must equal m a. So we know these two statements are true. Um, furthermore, we know that these two are equal in magnitude. So, let's say, see where we can go with this. Uh, oh, I should point out, why do I care about finding what this is? Well, this is basically our normal force, right? Which means that the friction force looks like mu s times f on m by m. That is the crux of this problem. So I need to find out this weird force to find f. So, alternative... Mm -hmm. Awkward. <laughs> I have too many unknowns right now, don't I? Oh, no I don't. Okay. So, problem is, I don't know what this is, I don't know what this is, I don't know what this is, but I also have to look in the y direction. And if I look in the y direction, um, I see, on little m at least, that fg minus mu s f on m 
by m is equal to zero. This is the whole not falling down condition that we're interested in. So, I know this f on m by m then must be fg by mu s. So if I come over here, I'm going to divide these two equations by each other. So I get f minus f um, divided by f um, is equal to m by m. So now I know the m's. And this thing, i got to figure out, this is, I should point out little m. So I'm now looking at something like this once I make the substitution. All right, I know what fg little m is, it's mg. I know what mu s is, I know what the masses are, I can solve for f. Done. You guys can find a calculator. Moving on to chapter seven. This was an interesting question about power. I passed up the one that had this weird, crazy calculus nonsense. Um, so we have here a ladle which is, as we know, a spoon, sliding on a surface attached to a spring. Because, you know, this happens all the time. If you have a ladle attached to a spring on a... Uh, whatever. All right. We know that the mass of the ladle is 0.3 kilograms. We know that the spring co coefficient, constant, whatever, of the spring is 500 newtons per meter. And we know that at the moment where the spring has no extension or compression, the kinetic energy of our ladle is 10 joules. So, first thing they want to know, at what rate is the spring doing work on the ladle as the ladle passes through its equilibrium position? So at this point, it is useful to know that the definition of power, one possible definition, is that it's the force, the power delivered by a force, I should say, is the magnitude of the force times the magnet dotted into the, the force dotted into the velocity, I think about magnitudes. Now, at the equilibrium position, F is equal to zero. So at this moment, the spring is doing nothing about, in terms of changing the energy of the spoon. So that's an easy part. If we look at B, at what rate is the spring doing work on the ladle when the spring is compressed 0.1 meter and the ladle is moving away from the equilibrium position? Did you like that really Oof. Um, no, thank you. I'm recording something. Sorry. Wait, is that like a voice recording? Yeah. That's really awkward. <laughs> Thank you for the offer. Anyway. Um, so, at what rank is the ladle is compressed and the ladle is moving away? So, this is compressed. 0 0.1 meter. Equilibrium is somewhere over here. Spoon is going that way. So, this means that the spoon is slowing down. Now, there are a couple different ways to look at this. We could figure out easily what the force is. You know, the force is simply going to be kx. But the question then is, what is the velocity? So that doesn't really help much. Um, except we could find the velocity. We know, and I'm going to cheat a little bit and do this in a chapter 8 way. Alright, we know that the all right, initial energy, final energy, good old conservation stuff. Initially, we have kinetic, no elastic. Finally, we have some kinetic, some elastic. So this we know is 1 half mv squared, but more importantly, we know it's 10 joules. This we know is 1 half mv final squared, and this we know is 1 half k x squared. So we know that v final, we know everything else, we know it's 10 minus a half kx squared by a half m, and we root that, and that gets us v. We know that v is, so yeah. So then we have v, we have f, go back to this good old definition of power. 
we note that the spoon is going that way, the force is going that way, so the dot product will be negative. You guys can find a calculator again, numbers. Chapter 8. So chapter 8 is again going to be kind of a conservation of energy thingy, but we found one that has a circle in it, so it's going to be nice and fun. This is number 34. So a boy is seated on a top of a hemispherical ice mound, seasonally appropriate. He's no longer on the top, he's now going off. Anyway, the radius of this hemispherical ice mound is 13, that's a big ice mound, holy crap. How big is this boy in the picture? The boy's like the size of the ice mound, he's some kind of giant. Anyway, um, question is, he begins to slide down the ice with negligible initial speed, so he's at the top, um, and when he's at the top, his kinetic energy is zero, and he begins to slide down. The question is, at what point does he just slide off and wind up a broken heap in a pile of snow? So, what is the condition for him to lose contact with the ice? So we may recall, we said that lose contact tends to mean that the normal force is zero. So if we take a look at him when he's at some arbitrary point, he has his weight acting downwards, and he has the normal force acting in some odd direction, uh, which is perpendicular. Now, we know that there must be directed radially inwards, um, blah, blah, blah. There must be a centripetal force for him to stay on the circle, right? Otherwise, he falls off and goes flying. So, we know that this centripetal force must always be mv squared over r. I need to finish this up quickly. Um, and so now if we look at this, it's basically going to be a component of gravity balanced against this normal force. Right? So apparently the normal force is not actually going to be that big, but whatever. So this is supplying FC. The normal force is basically taking away from it. So we want to basically find the condition where FC is equal to this component of gravity. Um, the one that's perpendicular to the surface. So at some height here, let's say this is the one where he falls, we need to know what the direction of the normal is relative to gravity. Um, hmm. This is a nice problem. So we basically want to know that angle. So whatever, so that's theta. So we want to say mv squared by r, which is this r, which I call the capital, looks like mg sine theta and now we need somehow to turn this angle into a height so if we look here's the top here is the point of no contact um, Here's what we've called theta. So this is not theta. So this is theta. So this is what? Hmm. Well, the center is down here. This is always going to be pointed towards the center, even though it doesn't look like that at all right now. I should have done this problem before I started recording this, shouldn't I have? Yes, I should have. Alright, so this is R. This is theta. So this is... R sine theta. Yeah. No, oh, no, coast. Darn it. Did I have my trig all backwards? Ah, I have my trig all backwards. 
Man, you guys gotta stop me before I start making stupid trick mistakes. It's just embarrassing. Um. Oh, yeah, so his... Whatever, so his change in height... H is R minus R cos theta. Uh, which makes sense, good. Because if theta is zero, if he hasn't fallen down, then he hasn't changed his height. So R looks like... H looks like R1 minus cos theta. Why do we need H, you might be asking? Because this has been so terribly coherent up to this point. Well, I need V. Because V is going to get me the centripetal force. To get V, I'm going to go conservation of energy. Now I'm going to say that, you know, his initial height, which looks like mg r1 minus cos theta, at his final height is all kinetic. So his final velocity is 2g r1 minus cos theta square root. That is our velocity. This velocity, we get to then take and dump up into here. Alright, it was a whirlwind tour, but hopefully... Some of that is helpful in some small way.